Good morning. Uh, my voice is a little rough here today. I, I, hope, I hope it works out. Um, it's an honor to, to speak to you this morning in honor of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, I appreciate the, on, uh, the irony that today is technically Lee Jackson Day in Virginia. Um, but Dr. King was certainly one of the most prominent figures of the 20th century. And he has come to represent to most Americans all that is best about America. The times it steps back from its cynicism, its squabbling, and its selfish political and social wrangling, and remembers that the goal of the nation is to form a more perfect union, to construct a society where all people are not only considered, but indeed are equal. However, as is true of most individuals who became heroes, King is now remembered in an almost flawless light, having been turned from a mortal with feet of clay to a superhero. This is a dangerous transformation because it makes future generations think that giants walked the world in the years before them. They thus become fearful, forgetting that those giants were people just like them, people who stumbled and wandered and worried as they strove to make a better world. I've based this talk off of a quote commonly attributed to MLK. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. Now, as a, as a historian, I feel obliged to note that it's unclear when and where King actually said that, um, which makes it a little dubious for me to be quoting it. Um, but it is undoubtedly a sentiment King expressed many times and in many speeches in context, if not precisely in those words. From the time he entered the national spotlight as a 26-year-old preacher during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 until the time he died just 18 years later, when assassinated while working with the sanitation workers of Memphis, Tennessee, he experienced many ups and downs and was keenly aware that often the efforts he engaged in didn't have easy and obvious conclusions when they began. The future was always uncertain, but despite this, indeed because of this, he came to understand that the goal to spread the love of Christ and the love of humanity to everyone, white, black, northern, southern, rich and poor, was a goal that required faith that even when the outcome was uncertain, the goal was worthy, and so one had to just go ahead and take the first step in faith. There are many excellent people speaking during this week of celebration. I hope you heard the uh, really amazing chapel on Wednesday, and I hope you'll be back here on Monday to hear uh, Dr. David Evans uh, speak as, as well. But today I was charged with covering a very specific topic, the history of Eastern Mennonites' journey in respect to inclusion. This is a topic that interests me greatly, and in preparation for this talk, I've reveled in that most geeky of historical recreations and spent several days reading new books and digging around in the archives and historical library of this fine institution um, to see what I can learn and, and how it can be applied to today. So with that, let me just dive in here. In his 2010 book, Daily Demonstrators, The Civil Rights Movement in Mennonite Homes and Sanctuaries, and I'm borrowing from this book very heavily today, um, Tobin Miller Shearer tells a powerful story showing how black and white Mennonite women came to exert the pressure that eventually led to the Virginia Conference and Eastern Mennonite changing their policies toward race. In the mid-1930s, EMC students began a mission in Newtown the African-American neighborhood in Harrisonburg, and they often defied both the church and state-ordered segregation rules of the time. The directors of the mission, Ernest and Fanny Schwarzendruber, had adamantly protested when in 1941 the Virginia Conference declared that communion, feet washing, and the exchange of the kiss of brotherhood should be segregated. But despite their protests, they stayed on and helped move the mission into a full church, Broad Street Mennonite, in 1942. some pictures. I, I, I forgot to do PowerPoint. Imagine that in me. That doesn't usually happen. Um, the next year, 1943, Roberta Webb, a local African-American educator and widowed mother of three daughters, joined their church. And shortly thereafter, she and the Swartzendrubers began pushing to have Eastern Mennonite School accept her daughters as students. This issue had first emerged in 1940 when a local black boy had asked to take courses at Eastern Mennonite. 
But though sympathetic, the Virginia Conference, which owned the school, advised him to take the courses via correspondence because opposition was likely to arise between the attitudes of northern and southern students and because the state of Virginia had ruled against the attendance of whites and blacks at the same public school. So when Webb, a few years later, and again with the support of the Schwarzendrubers, again um, had her daughter again apply to EMC and had her refused, Fanny Schwarzendruber staged her own protest march. Her new Mennonite sister, Roberta Webb, was having her daughters kept out of the conference's colleges due to segregationist policies. At a communion service that was once again segregated because of conference rules, she finally had had enough. In the midst of the service, she grabbed her daughter Rhoda in her arms and stormed out of the church, and not waiting for her husband to follow her, she walked the four miles home to their farm. When Ernest finally caught up to her, she flatly pronounced that she'd never again sit through such a service. A few months later, the mission board removed the sorts and drivers from their position. Webb, however, did not leave and kept up her persistence. In 1945, she again pushed to, her, to have her daughter, Peggy, admitted to EM Eastern Mennonite. A few other young African Americans from the church applied that year as well. The conference again denied them, so instead, Webb sent Peggy to Heston College, a Mennonite junior college in Kansas. Margaret Durstein, a student at Eastern Mennonite from 1944 to 46, remembered that this issue was highly controversial on campus, as there were students and professors on both, on both sides. She recalled, I will never forget a poster placed near the front entrance of the old ad building. It showed the president at the front door, blessing a graduate ready to leave for missions in Africa, while the dean held the rear door shut with a prospective black student from Harrisburg trying to enter. That poster doesn't seem to exist in our archives anymore, but I'd love to find it. <laughs> but Webb's persistence soon paid off, and the conference position began to shift. In 1946, EMC allowed in a brother and sister from China, the Chins, the first non-white students to attend. Then Virginia Mennonite Conference changed its governance policy, allowing EMC Eastern Mennonite to set its own admissions criteria, freeing it from direct conference control. With this change, EMC's board then changed the admissions rules, defying local custom and law, and admitted Willis Johnson, a local black man, as a day student in 1948. The following year, Ada Webb, Peggy's sister, became the first full-time black student at Eastern Mennonite, and in the fall of 1950, Marjorie Thompson became the first black student who boarded on campus. For various reasons, however, none of these students persisted through to graduation. However, in 1952, having graduated from Heston College, Webb's daughter Peggy returned to EMC, and in 1954, a few months before the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education decision, she became the first black student to graduate from EMC, making EMC the first undergraduate institution in Virginia and perhaps the entire South to reverse its racial policy and graduate a black student. Whoops. At her graduation, Peggy Webb, along with her fellow classmate, J.B. Landis, led the assembly in a hymn they'd written for the occasion. There we go. Landis remembers that there was quite a stir because of this, partly because Peggy was black, but largely because she was a woman who was not wearing a head covering and was leading a song. <laughs> the next year, 1955, the Virginia Conference reversed its 1940 statement and desegregated its religious ordinances, noting that there has been progress in attitudes of our own people toward the New Testament principles in matters of race relations. But the tensions were far from over. In January of 1954, EMC sociology student Audrey Shank visited a local Mennonite church and asked its members about their thoughts about EMC's desegregation policies. You can't read that, but that's all right. I'll tell you what it says. Um, this amazing document shows the complexity and fervor with which this debate raged within the Virginia churches at the time, and how issues of Southern culture and Christian understanding played out in both the conscious and unconscious minds of its members. A young female school teacher was glad EMC had changed its policies, noting, I would never object to eating with a Negro or singing with one or entertaining one in my home, 
but noted, however, that she would draw the line at having one as a roommate, explaining that because Negroes often come from a lower type of home, we have gotten into the habit of thinking of them collectively as not being neat and personally clean. Self-conscious of this statement, she went on to note that Christian teachings and better knowledge should make folks better on race relations, but felt that a bit of Southern attitude rubs off on us, perhaps, as a result of our public school experience. One tends to feel sympathetic to one's state and its part in the Civil War. Most pervasive in the comments, however, were issues that related to sexuality, marriage, and race. A young wife noted, I think there is nothing wrong with their coming to EMC, except for the inevitable courtship and intermarriage problem. I don't think God intended intermarriage. And in a situation like that, girls would fall head over heels for nice colored fellows. <laughs> a high school aged girl was more progressive when she said if she, when asked if she'd room with a black girl, she exclaimed, why I'd love it, and went on to say, I think EMC should open her doors wide to colored people. I don't think there would be any problem, even of courtship that could not be met. The pastor, however, was less sure. He first referenced the popular segregationist apologetic of the race of Ham and the division of races ordained through, through Noah's three sons, but then noted that all men, regardless of race, should have equal rights, equal opportunity, and equal privileges as citizens within a given country. He concluded, however, saying that while strict lines of segregation should not be erected or maintained, neither should we interfere with natural groupings of the races for religious, cultural, or political purposes, and thus discourage DMC's practices. But Eastern Mennonite did not change its policy, and even though many local Mennonite congregations and leaders felt that this was a, a religious as well as social mistake, these changes also caught the attention of the wider world. And though EMC rarely appeared in the larger Virginia press, in 1959, amidst the massive resistance movement that kept Virginia public schools firmly segregated, the Richmond Times-Dispatch ran an article about the six colleges in Virginia that had allowed in black students, noting that EMC was the first school in Virginia to desegregate, and that in 1959 it had more black students than any other undergraduate institution except UVA. That same year, at a conference on Mennonites and race held in Chicago that included MLK's co-leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, Ralph Abernathy, a young African-American man named Vincent Harding asked how Mennonites could say they supported nonconformity to the world and racial equality, but could also slavishly and silently follow the national practice of segregation. He felt Mennonites had remained too long separate and asked the audience to let black folks into the deep places of Mennonite fellowship. Harding had grown up in New York City, served in the military where he grew to question its coercive ways, and then while pursuing his MA and PhD in history at the University of Chicago, had discovered Anabaptists and began attending Woodlawn Mennonite Church. By 1958, he was calling this church his home, and it, in turn, called this dynamic young man to be its associate pastor. <clears throat> while embracing his newfound church tradition, Harding was also becoming closely tied to the growing civil rights movement. He traveled south and met with MLK in, late, in the late 1950s, and from these experiences began challenging Mennonites to become more involved in the movement. By the end of 1958, he wrote an article entitled, To My Fellow Christians, An Open Letter to Mennonites, in which he challenged Mennonites to adjust their strict non-resistant practices and to begin engaging the political and social world to help their black brothers and sisters. He asked, can the voices which once sounded so loudly in opposition to warfare now be silent when men are destroying other men and themselves with hatred? This challenge was repeated by MLK himself. Knowing of Mennonites' historic peace stance and professed commitment to brotherhood, in 1959, after having struggled through the Montgomery bus boycott and other civil rights actions, King asked a white Mennonite minister, where have you Mennonites been? Mennonite leaders took that question to heart and began slowly but more fully engaging the growing nonviolent civil rights movement. In 1960, they had MLK come speak at Goshen College, where he met with Guy F. Hirschberger, one of the leading voices in the Mennonite church who supported the movement and wrote passionately about racial equality, but insisted that biblical ideas of non-resistance precluded Mennonites from using political or social activism to bring about change. Their goal was to change hearts through love and compassion, not through coercion, and that included activities such as marches, sit-ins, and political protests. 
Harding understood this tradition, but was convinced that something needed to be done immediately to end racial injustice. Thus, in 1960, he and his new wife, Rosemary Freeney, the first African-American woman to have graduated from Goshen College, accepted a position within the Mennonite Central Committee um, when they opened a peace house in Atlanta, Georgia, a house located just a block from MLK's house and that was to be used to house both black and white volunteers and to promote God's healing love. Vincent and Rosemary sent out a flyer entitled, Wanted Climbers for a Southern Hill, and it called young Mennonites to join them in living and working together as an integrated household amidst the, amidst the hostility of the segregated society they lived in. They said, let it be clear to all who would answer the call for climbers, there will be obstacles from within and without, but we must still climb. Like MLK, they were calling people to take the first step in faith. I bring up the Harding story now because in 1962 and 1963, they came to Eastern Mennonite and their reports back to MCC show the issues that were going on here at that time and their perspective as black Mennonites. They first came to Harrisonburg in May of 1962 and noted that upon our entrance into the situation, we found two disturbing but nonetheless understandable, though surely not entirely justifiable responses. First, we found that there were many Mennonites who were totally unaware of the extent to which their practices of segregation and racial injustice were being carried on in their community. For instance, yes, I've been to Howard Johnson's many times, but it never occurred to me that I had never seen any Negroes eating there. Secondly, we found that those who were made aware often reacted in this way. What can we do about it? We are non-resistant, so we can't boycott, can't picket, can't sit in, etc. What are we supposed to do? They felt that these reactions resulted from a frightening moral insensitivity to the sin of racial prejudice and discrimination, and they experienced the deepest feelings of sadness when they learned that a Mennonite owned ho hotel and he refused to allow African Americans to stay in it. He had even turned away the parents of black students at EMC and the Virginia Conference had done nothing. This they saw as an act of unfaithfulness and further they pointed out that though Mennonites were saying they couldn't protest against the laws of the land, a local merchant had just been kept from a liquor license because of quote, the righteous wrath of a Mennonite boycott. They thus concluded, since it appeared to us that segregation and other forms of injustice to God's children are at least as immortal and immoral and sinful as drunkenness, we could only conclude that they have not yet been gathered into the official Mennonite collection of social sins. <clears throat> the EMC Peace Club that invited the Hardings to campus asked for a list of things that they could do, short of picketing and sit-ins, to help. The Hardings replied first with what they called a primary requirement, compassion, saying, for if we do not really care about the oppressed, we can do nothing on their behalf. Then, instead of making suggestions, they ask a series of questions. Should Mennonite teachers continue to be members of segregated teacher organizations? Should Mennonites use facilities or patronize businesses that black people were not allowed to use? Should Eastern Mennonite do more to recruit from local black high schools? Should it use its radio program, the Mennonite Hour, to speak out against racial injustice? And then they ask, what would happen if Mennonite parents refused to participate in the segregated school system and withdrew their children for even two days in protest? What if Mennonites simply spoke to the school board out of deep concern? They then addressed the Virginia Mennonite community and EMC as church brothers and sisters, recognizing the difficulty of defying state law, but also of their requirement to do just that if Christ demanded it. They said, no church or college could be true to Christ in a segregated society without having to face the cross. If the Mennonites of the Shenandoah Valley speak clearly on the issues of race in their native place, even at so late an hour, they are in danger of social ostracism, persecution, loss of money for the school, and a reputation for troublemaking. However, for the sake of the church, we pray deeply that the Mennonites of the valley will stand high on some exalted ground and be counted as those who will contend against evil and make no peace with oppression. The Hardings visit shocked and offended some members of the community, inspired and energized others, but left few unchanged. A Mennonite church executive 
was upset by the Hardings and asked, can one person go into a Mennonite community and have one meeting with less than 200 present, then have a meeting with the student body at EMC, and then write an accurate evaluation of the race situation in the community? He clearly thought not, suggesting that such behavior was harmful. But many others were inspired to begin pushing harder for change. Four members of the EMC community, including history professors Sam Horst and John Lapp, began an organization of concerned citizens to begin pushing for desegregation and equality. Soon the committee had 30 members, both black and white, and it was largely responsible for facilitating the desegregation of Harrisonburg schools and hospitals. The Mennonite Hour, that had already addressed racial discrimination once before the Hardings' arrival, began pushing the issue far more fervently, incurring some nasty letters and community pushback along the way. And, in it, and it was at this time that Eastern Mennonite High School and college students began organizing sporting events between themselves and the students at the African American Lucy Sims High School. Retired professor John Horst tells me that the teams played fairly evenly with the college students. Um, others have told me that the first game between Sims and EMHS resulted in EMHS being blown out 80 to 11. <laughs> Harrisonburg Mennonites invited Vincent Harding back in 1963, and he did a week-long series of Broad, at Broad Street Church that continued to push, frustrate, challenge, and inspire local Mennonites. It, in his wide-ranging travels, Harding also encountered Eastern Mennonites' influence in the midst of Mississippi, where Titus Bender, a former EMC student, had been working toward racial reconciliation since the, the late 1950s in Meridian, Mississippi. Titus spoke with us here during Wednesday's chapel, and he told us his version of a story that Vincent Harding has also told several times over the years. For when Vincent and Rosemary arrived in Meridian, they met Titus at a gas station so as not to have to ask directions to his house, an awkward thing to ask in such a highly segregated society. When they arrived at the gas station, however, there were several local men watching them menacingly. They were glad when they saw Titus pull up, but instead of him just driving on for them to follow, he stopped, got out of his car, and when Vincent also got out, Titus greeted him with a hearty hug and, as Vincent remembers it, a holy kiss of brotherhood. <laughs> Such a blatant and public display of affection shocked but touched the Hardings and undoubtedly stunned the onlookers at the gas station as well. And this act endeared Titus to the Hardings from that moment forward. Titus had never met them before, and society said that they shouldn't be together, but he boldly took a first step in faith. He expressed that one... He expressed the one thing the Hardings had said in their report was essential, compassion. Despite the hostile circumstances and menacing social and legal pressures of the society around them, he bravely took a blind first step of faith and embraced, quite literally, inclusion. Now today, for MLK Day in 2014, I think it's appropriate to tell the next part of Titus and Vincent's story, especially considering that Titus is still here among us, and Vincent is coming back to our community again in February to talk to us once again. After he left Mississippi in 1969, having lived and worked through intensely, intense daily negotiations between white and black folks he'd grown to love, and the bombing of one of the churches he worked with closely three times, and working side by side with one of the young men murdered during Freedom Summer, Titus went to graduate school taught in Oklahoma, and then came back to Eastern Mennonite College in the mid-1950s, serving as a professor of social work. In the years that followed, however, Titus again took a radical and what many saw as rash and dangerous stance. In the 1980s, Titus began speaking out for the rights of gays and lesbians. And in the 1990s, he was one of the founding members of the Welcome Committee that pushed the church to accept these brothers and sisters into its midst, to look past their fears and trepidation, and to take a first step in faith. For these actions, Titus and his fellow members of the Welcome Committee were ostracized by some parts of the Mennonite Church, for they were openly violating the statements, policies, and norms of both the Mennonite Church and the larger society. At a speech in the midst of this controversy, Vincent Harding once again told a group of Mennonites the story of his full embrace first meeting with Titus in Mississippi, and noted that it seemed that Titus was once again guilty of openly embracing the wrong people at the wrong time. Now, in 2014, this community is once again being challenged with a decision about equality and inclusion, 
one that challenges social and church norms, defies traditional belief structures, and thus fills many of our community with feelings of nervousness and even anger. The future is unsure, but the question now is, in many significant ways, the same question that was asked by MLK and the Hardings 50 years ago. Will we take the first step in faith? 